Welcome to Sky Fashion Hub 2020 from the Braylon Pavilion. Thank you for joining us. As we all know, global health precautions, quarantine measures and border closures continue to interrupt daily life. Times are uncertain and the world seems to have gone temporarily awry. At Sky, we're trying to take adversity in our stride and creatively problem solve. Over the coming months, Sky will broadcast a content-rich, for the most part Australia-focused, visually compelling virtual suite of conversations, all within the context of our usual hub format. Our cast of designers, makers, writers, authors, academics, theorists, gallerists, curators, museum leaders, activists and philanthropists are currently and progressively being filmed. We hope their wisdom and expertise will provide both inspiration and comfort to you at this trying time. Be well, be kind and above all, be safe. As new railways stretch their tracks across the country, the new Guomindang order Zhang has brought begins to offer comfort and luxuries to the cities he controls. Industry booms, production soars, engineers and young industrialists find, for the first time, careers opening to modern talents. Universities flourish, parade their graduates full of hope. In cities, department stores begin to offer Chinese taste of every modern wear. Modern dress takes subtle hold on Chinese fashion, while rich Chinese in centers like Shanghai begin enjoying privileges until now saved for foreigners. If I'm in dear old Shanghai, then I'm dancing sweetheart with you. Vivian, today in our conversation, we'll make reference to your two most recent publications, your personal memoir, Bright Swallow, in which you describe your own very difficult teenage years, having been effectively orphaned at the age of 15, and your struggle against conformity at that time. We will also make reference to your novel, Dragon's Gate, which tracks the fortune of a young fictitious character, Shi Ding, who goes from being a committed Red Guard to a compassionate young man. Both are set during Mao's Cultural Revolution, in other words, during the 1960s and the 1970s. Both celebrate the power of storytelling and literature. In fact, literature provided a lifeline for you and for others during this time. But this begs my first question, Vivian. What have these works to do with fashion? Well, I think we would both agree that whenever we mention about the fashion, we think about diversity, uh, creativity, and self-expression and the style. So I think based on this concept, I can answer you the question, the link between my books and the fashion. The first, the idea of writing this novel, Dragon's Gate, come, from, uh, come to me about four, more than four decades ago in 1978. The Chinese government at the time decided to lift the book ban in a dramatic fashion. The reason I say it's a dramatic fashion is the government ordered every single bookstore across the nation start selling the reprints of world classics on the 1st of May in oh. 1978. So started from midnight, everyone was queued in front of the bookstores. Including you, Vivian, I'm sure. Absolutely, oh. and shivering uh, in the line. But everyone was so excited. It's in human nature to value variety and uh, creativity, uh, whether it's in literature, in food, in clothes, but the, during the Cultural Revolution, Chinese people were forced to read two novels mm -hmm. and watch two films and see eight operas. And all of them, you know, represented one theme only, that is class struggle. Class struggle in literature, in opera, in ballet, and uh, in uh, school performance. And there's only one bestseller, that is Chairman Mao's red book. Yes. And anything else um, 
will be considered as poisonous stuff and has to be destroyed. I recall images in Nazi Germany when the Nazis burnt thousands and thousands of banned books. And these images prompted the very famous German Jewish writer Heinrich Heine to say, first they came for the books, then they'll come for the people. That's exactly what happened during the Cultural Revolution. Vivian, in this context, I can't help but recall the very beginning of your novel, Dragon's Gate, chapter one of part one, entitled Snow. This section reads very much like a prophecy of things to come, a pr prophecy that's transmitted through a very vivid and captivating dream of the young main protagonist, Xi Ding. In his dream, Shi Ding sees a white ghostly figure who turns everything that she comes into contact with a blinding white. People she touches, even children, are transformed, transformed into colourless and inert objects who are then absorbed into the stark white background. What was particularly frightening for Shi Ding was this dream was set within his own residential compound in Beijing. Vivian, when you wrote this dream se sequence, was it designed as an omen, as a portent of things to come? That is to say, the disappearance of all colour and vibrancy and variety, and that what Xi Ding and you all faced were years of uniformity, drabness and shapelessness. It's actually, interestingly, when I sat down to start writing the beginning of this novel, I didn't consider it as an omen, because there, there are a lot of uh, snow scenes and the dreams in this novel. But now, uh, hindsight, in hindsight, I can see, I realize it actually worked as a prophecy. So perhaps I was unconsciously and predicting the bleak world that lay ahead of Shi Ding and for all, and all of, of us, you, yes. and for more than 10 years. So that is why we queued for those books, because they are different. Uh, the quest for difference is everywhere in human life and finds its ultimate expression in fashion. That's I why agree. I agree. The, uh, my novel has everything to do with fashion. And also, my novel itself, uh, itself is re revolves uh, around the unexplained the suicide of Shi Wangcai, a tailor. This tailor, uh, he is the father of Shi Ding, the protagonist, and uh, which his suicide said of the journey of Shi Ding's uh, to discover. He wanted to know who and what drove his father uh, to take his own life. In the end, the ultimate answer to this question is the father died because of the drabness of the world around him. He couldn't stand anymore. In his own words, a life without taste, color, and music is not a life. And is there anything that embodies taste and color and opposes drabness more than fashion? I agree. In its best yeah. sense. I agree, and that, that brings us here to the, to the topic of fashion. Vivian, if I can ask you, how were people meant to dress during the Cultural Revolution? And why was colourful clothing, or even colour itself, seen as a threat to the revolution? Well, we all know uh, dress uh, not, is not only, uh, does not only have the um, practical function, uh, also has uh, the symbolic function. Yes. Uh, in nowadays, uh, anyone who has a good sense of themselves, um, they dress to express their uh, personality and to express, uh, to indicate their social status, and for the young, at least, uh, to arouse uh, sexual interest. But the clothes were worn um, during the Cultural Revolution had only one single symbolic function, that is to express the faithfulness to the proletarian value. Mm. Utilitarian. They were just seen as worn in a utilitarian way. Absolutely. Yeah. Any individual expression uh, was severely suppressed. And the, the age was uh, puritanical. Uh, romantic love 
was a taboo topic, mm -hmm. and uh, dressing to show your beauty or to express your uh, sexuality is totally out of question. Clothing was genderless, shapeless, and colorless. So the, all of that in order to ward off any possible corrosion. My uh, favorite character in this book, the, 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 the man I love the most is Shi Wang Cai, even though I have no idea uh, where I get this, um, the, the image of this person, because uh, there's no such man in my life. He and is quite um, exceptional. He is quite. He is. I, one of my friends read uh, the, the, the book up to the point that he killed himself. He was so upset. He said, I hate you. How can you, how dare you to let the, a beautiful man like Shi Wang Cai um, just died like that. He's a tailor. I think he uh, uh, represents everything I love. The color, the clothes, love, and love the life. That's the very important thing. I want to read a little uh, bit about, uh, as a tailor, he, um, for him, the most important thing is, is dress. The one particular dress to express his love. Just that little bit. It's the saddest part, too. Mm. Please. Okay. This is Uncle Ma talk to Shi Ding, this part. This is Uncle Ma talk to Shi Ding. Your dad said he never loved your mother and he finally found his true love. I don't get it, Uncle Ma. He told me, I made the dress. You know, Shi Ding, we tailors have this common rule that you only make, Shi Ding finished his sentence, you only make one garment for your true love. Yes, I guess he told you my old master's story. There's a legend that if a tailor is false to his love, the dress he made for his beloved will turn into thousands of needles. So my old master, your grandfather, didn't make the dress until your grandma turned 50. He loved her too much to risk harming her. And my dad, oh, your dad, he said he made the dress, but he harmed her. Who is she? How did he harm her? He didn't tell me her name, but just kept on blaming himself for something that happened to the woman. I was there, brother, he said to me. She looked at me with expectation in her huge eyes. I should have been her hero, but I just stood there in the crowd of onlookers. I'm not sure if I even avoided her gaze. When others began to shout slogans, I joined in. She heard my voice, turned her head, and smiled at me. See, she saw through me. She didn't swallow hard. The sad thing is, the woman turned head to Shi Wang Cai, actually tried to tell him that I heard you. I will be back. Yes, yes, that's how I... So in, in this society, you would be mad to dress, to show anything different, and to show your beauty. Did, did that enforced dress code apply even on special occasions, such as weddings or festival celebrations, even then? Yes, absolutely. Workers from the chemical fertilizer factory visit a people's commune to celebrate the festival held on the eve of National Day. This year is the 17th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China, and at the same time is the first year of our country's third five-year plan. We are the masters of our own nation. We must fulfill the third five-year plan by our own efforts. From now on, the commune members can come to work in the chemical fertilizer factory, and the workers at the chemical fertilizer factory, as well as their families, can participate in agricultural work. And I think that this is good. 
So it would appear that dress was seen as a class marker during the Cultural Revolution. Absolutely. And that there is only one class you could align with, that is, work, the, the working class. Anything else was simply improper. You probably remember in my memoir, I was nagging my mother to make me a white colored cotton shirt I do. and the blue pair of a blue khaki well. trousers. It's simply because I wanted to be the same, avoid being different in public. It was everyone's dream at the time. A question that I have to ask you, Vivian, and I'm sure many people would ask you, is why was it so easy in China at that time to enforce conformity of dress, to, in, to enforce this very strict dress code? I think this is a very interesting question. We have to look into the Chinese history and the culture. Although at the time there were people like Shi Wang Cai who resentfully, you know, applied with the dress code, Unfortunately, most of the Chinese people embraced the dress code without question because uh, conformity is deeply rooted in Chinese culture because of these thousands of years of absolutist um, political systems uh, which made this uh, tradition have been very intolerant to any kind of differences. Blending in meant safety. Yes. So, a Ming Dynasty thinker uh, called uh, Li Zhi, he had summoned it up very well. He said, among a group of 10, if one wears a hat while the other nine don't, he will be regarded as mad. However, if one doesn't wear a hat while the other nine do, the bareheaded one will be the mad one. You can see in this picture, the difference alarmed the people. It was Pierre Cardin, who strolled through the street of Beijing and stirred up the locals in 1978, just after the Cultural Revolution ended. Yes. And three months later, he held the first fashion show in Beijing, according to the Xinhua news agent. The uh, various colors on the runway contrasted sharply with the uniform blacks and the grays of the audience. So it's very interesting. But I want to pose a question. Imagine if it had not been a foreigner, not been Pierre Cardin, and the time had been two years earlier, the alarm would lead to, uh, would lead to uh, public denunciation immediately. And we're not talking about only verbal abuse, because during the Cultural Revolution, there were gang of youngsters, so-called Red Guards. They were equipped with scissors, and uh, they were looking around to see whoever was wearing bourgeois clothes. And if they found them, they would just simply slash them with their scissors. The protagonist, Shi Ding, he was one of the gang members. Yes, yes. Because we lived right next to the Imperial Beihai Park, we, uh, we, we, uh, we have seen, uh, we, we saw this kind of uh, horror often. It was not only clothes. One of my neighbors, who had a naturally curly hair, which is not common in, among Chinese, and she was stopped at the park and had her head shaved in the yin and yang style. So called yin yang style means they shave half of your head mm. and to humiliate you in front of her kids. Uh, but I must say, I have to be honest, not many of us reacted like Shi Wang Kishai did because we were scared by what we saw. Yes. But on the other hand, it was exciting. It was happening to others, not to us. And we might even have enjoyed the, the others' suffering and the humiliation. And why didn't you obey the order? As a yes, sense of a yes. justification. Yes. Self-righteousness in, in a sense, it, yes. It, that's what I said. Thousands of years of history and the culture had made China 
more prone to conformity. Vivian, I look at these pictures and I look at you and I have to ask myself the question, you coming from this culture of conformity, how have you been able to retain your individuality? And where did your strong interest in fashion and, and creativity in fashion begin? Well, um, I, I guess I was doomed to be different from very young age um, because of my family's bad origin and consequently the poor childhood. My father's salary was completely confiscated by the government as the punishment, one of the punishment. While most people could afford one set of clothes at least to fit at the times, I had to wear those old clothes recycled by my mother. She had a um, coat in Polish wool and that became a pair of uh, trousers of mine. Mm, I remember that. She yeah. had a navy blue uh, with um, yellow thin uh, stripes of silk mandarin dress, very beautiful, I'm thinking now. <laughs> and that turned into a pleated skirt for me. But at the time, I was not happy at all. I was hurt because I felt all those clothes was very dowdy and made me abnormal and crushed my uh, teenager's desire to belong. But this might be the reason why I'm so conscious, so focused on fashion and why they always come in, into my writing. Because after many years, gradually after I grew uh, mature, I realized how tastefully mm. I was dressed by my mother. So I adopted this uh, individual dress sense. To sum up, it's ironically, being poor and having to dress differently from a very young age might be where my interest in fashion started. Yes, no, I can understand that. But from, from reading your memoir, it's clear that your family hadn't always been poor. Oh, absolutely not. My mother come from a very kind of a well of upper middle class family, and she herself uh, was a college graduate, the, among the first the generation of Chinese women. Where close concerns, and she had a great sense. Yes, yes. You say you say in your memoir that someone once remarked to, to you that even in a gunny sack, your mother would look bourgeois and sophisticated. Absolutely. Because she wore clothes, it's kind of a Chinese take on Western style. Uh, I think you probably are familiar with the uh, um, the image that um, a fashionable Chinese woman in Shanghai during the mm, war time, yes. and she 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 was in that mode. And I re I remember at home, she uh, wore the chicken skin shoes for comfort. Uh, satin dresses for beauty, mm. and uh, foxtail scholars, uh, fo foxtail uh, collars for fashion. I'm developing an image of her yeah. here in my mind. Outside, when she worked as a union leader, she would put on very smart um, jacket, uh, double buttoned, slim vest, and uh, big folded uh, collar. So. Um, even after the Cultural Revolution started, when clothes were not supposed to show any agenda, and her clothes were always well fitted. So therefore, her breast line, her waist, long legs were never completely concealed. Mm. So I can put this way, after the Cultural Revolution, after 1966, her old wardrobe disappeared, but her sense of address stayed with me. Yes, well, I can attest to that. It certainly has stayed with you. But Vivian, there's one other major influence on your sense of dress that is described in your memoir, and that's the woman you refer to as fourth grandma. Uh, can you say something about her, the woman who she was, and what role she played in shaping your own feelings about colour and design and style? 
Okay, first I must say, when I received the instruction today, I have to wear neutral tone clothes. <laughs> it was a disaster because under my false grandma's influence, all my clothes, you know, they loud and colorful and full of patterns. So I dived into my wardrobe, find this very few <laughs> colorless clothes. Okay, my false grandma, she was an illiterate peasant woman. Um, she was, she had been the concubine of my father's land-owning brother. After my father's brother and uh, they, her, her, his son were killed by the Communist Party during the land reform in 1948, um, she came with us. She was spared because she came from a poor um, peasant origin. She nurtured us, she tried, she was very grateful that uh, we saved her. So she nurtured us, cooked things for us, and um, constantly uh, making things with her ingenious mm -hmm. hands. I must say, false grandma revealed the power of a color and the pattern to me. Um, even though um, whatever she made to my mother's eye probably too primitive because her knowledge came from the folk arts. But to me, everything is beautiful. That's why I wrote a short story called False Grandma. Um, although it's fictionalized, the, the, the woman in that story uh, absolutely is not my false grandma. But the many details were inspired by my memory of her. Yes. And I'd like to read briefly here from that short story uh, when you write about your fourth grandma. At the spring festival, the children would come together to see whose new clothes were more eye-catching and whose pockets were fuller with all sorts of goodies. The Xie ch family's children were forever champions. They were attired in splendid winter garments. The boys wore admirable big collars and the girls' hair was tied with skillfully made flowers or butterflies. The delicacies in their hands were most appealing to the neighbors' children. There were varied shaped dumplings, deep fried sesame twisters, crunchy spring onion pancakes, and magic zodiac biscuits. During the lantern festival, the children competed to hold the most beautiful lantern. The fourth grandma started by cutting thin bamboo strips and bending them into different shapes. Then she drew patterns and dyed sorghum paper and finally pasted the paper over the bamboo frames. At the end of the day, there would be lanterns in the shapes of fantail goldfish, three-layered water lilies, white eyebrowed gods of longevity, and mantis, cricket, and scorpions, poised to strike, hanging everywhere, inside and outside the Shia's house. On the night of the festival, the Shia family's children, one by one, holding different lanterns, came into the street. Not till the other children had taken in all the details of their lanterns did they return home and reappear with other lanterns. Almost every year, their showing off made other neighbours' children burn with envy all night. Yes, those memories, um, uh, they are engraved in my mind. From my memoir, you know, I didn't have a lucky childhood. No, But indeed. 1964, 1965, those two years, that magical and accelerating festival scenes really always stayed with me. When the cover, cu Cultural Revolution started, my false grandma, she just couldn't help to keep on bringing color and the shape into our life. That's why my mother had to decide to send her home for both protecting her yes. and protecting ourselves. So we're talking about innate human desire here. It's very dangerous to display your desire during the dark period like the Cultural Revolution. But there's always someone and sometime try to take the risk yes. to push close to the limits. So there are two very uh, funny examples. Some of you may know of uh, Monique, the wife of uh, the Cambodian king Sihanouk, and Imelda uh, Marcus, the wife of the Philippine dictator. 
And they were both warmly welcomed by Chairman Mao during the Cultural Revolution. Monique was way, wore all kind of a different shade of a pink. <laughs> and uh, Imelda um, has that uh, funny uh, shoulder puffs. So some people used these opportunities. In honor of Chairman Mao's guest, the pink, which would normally be considered as poisonous color and become 1969's summer color. And the uh, uh, 1974, the bourgeois frivolous uh, shoulder puffs and start coming to young women's shoulder. It's extraordinary. Yeah. So uh, that's the only two variation in fashion during the Cultural Revolution. However, when every young girl wore pink and my false grandma attempted to make a hot pink shirt for me, my mother intervened. She gave me the first lesson in fashion and style. Yes. Yes, no, I remember that well, because at the time when I read that in your memoir, I marvelled at your mother's ability to retain her independence of, of thought and opinion, particularly in those times, uh, and, and particularly in regard to fashion. And I would like to read something here from your memoir that illustrates that very clearly. Because in your memoir, Bright Swallow, you write of your mother's strong and lasting influence on you, even though she died when you were just 15 years of age. And you specifically describe how she tried to impart to you a sense of personal style and good taste in clothing. Uh, and I quote, My mother liked to talk, never gossip, but rather share her opinions on life. And her favourite topics were clothes and adventure. In clothes, she preferred the simple and the natural. She had a mandarin dress made of Georgette with thin yellow stripes on a navy blue background. And when I turned 10, she made me a pleated skirt out of it. I didn't like it because at the time, young girls were wearing red or hot pink dresses with bubbled shoulders, as you've just referred to. When my mother saw my long face, she gave me my first lesson on style. She took out from the sideboard a blue, patent, a blue plate patterned after the Ming dynasty and a multicoloured mug in the manner of the Queen. Which one do you like? She asked me. I pointed to the mug. Shaking her head, she said, Beauty exists in simplicity and taste is reflected in subtlety. Then she told me how Chinese civilization had reached its peak in the Ming dynasty so the Ming design represented confidence and elegance. On the other hand, the designs of the Manchurian rulers of Qing were saturated with the vulgarity of the nouveau riche. Red or hot pink is not the colour for your darker complexion, and bubble shoulders not only make you shorter, but also look cheap and showy, just like this. And she pointed to the mug. So the result of that lesson is I never wear pink yeah. and avoid no, any, <laughs> any puffs in shoulders. We now can see that uh, keeping individuality is not just about clothes. It's also about critical thinking. Yes. I think my mother not only taught me about the color and the style, but also about to think critically, to ask questions and not become a blind follower. It's become evident, I think, all through our conversation, Vivian, not just today, but in the, in the months leading up to this, that dress or style depends largely upon culturally accepted codes. Let's bring it up to the present day, if I may. And I'd like your opinion on this. If people fail to retain their individuality and originality, specifically in the context of fashion, because that's what we're talking about here. What, in your view, are the consequences? I think the first consequences uh, is to, to harm your own image and to deny your own, your self-expression. I would like to tell a funny story. A couple of years ago, I went to um, Max Meyer's 
clothes store in DFO, in Homebush DFO. And uh, while I was there, suddenly a busload of Chinese tourists arrived. And uh, about a group of seven, eight Chinese women rushed into this store. Apparently their time was limited. They were only given about a half hour. You have to buy and uh, go. And among these eight women, uh, there was one quite plump uh, and uh, fair-skinned, very beautiful woman. She chose one jewel-colored, dark green Max Mara dress. She tried it on. She looked beautiful. And then the rest, the seven and eight, immediately, one of them, each of them, pick up one and put it on. Some of them, their skinny body frame couldn't support that dress at all. Others, they have even darker com uh, complexion than I, mine. And so that the dark green color didn't fit them at all. However, half hour later, the shop assistants are very happy. They sold eight <laughs> dresses. So that's what I say. This is kind of a first harm is you harm your own image. And not only that, inevitably, it will lead to voluntary conformity. It's like in my memoir I mentioned, when I, during the Cultural Revolution, to avoid being punished, the, some student leader like Ying would, to, would tell us, tomorrow everyone wear this and that. That's because we believed we are not singled out. But we were under political pressure. Yes. It's not like this voluntary conformity. Yes, yes. No, and, and as regards voluntary conformity, I would agree with you. It would, would appear often that even when there is no pressure from without, uh, from, from authority figures, that people, and I would often say young people in particular, will slavishly follow trends. And if I could give a little example of my own here, I think here of German school students. Following World War II, um, uni school uniforms were abolished in Germany. But even a casual observer in Germany today could not help but remark that, or notice that German school students somehow have created a uniform way of dressing all of their own. And my own daughter was on exchange in Germany in, nine, in 2012 and went to school there. And her host sister was aghast when she planned to wear her long flowing skirts and sort of folksy tops that were, had become her own personal style at the time, where she planned to wear these to German school. And her host sister said, under no Shop. circumstances, if you don't want to create unwanted attention and so on. And she said, you must wear jeans and a T-shirt and preferably from the German fashion house H&M. So there was absolutely no, no compulsion for them to do this, but certainly what I would call voluntary conformity. Conformity, yeah. Vivian, voluntary conformity I see as alarming, as I'm sure you do. Uh, but another consequence of not retaining individuality, particularly today when there is an absolute abundance of choice, would be what I term conspicuous consumption. And I'm reminded here of a conversation I had with a student of mine who, once she left school, she went on to study art and fashion design. And over a coffee with her one day, I she mentioned to me that she was working for a leading fashion house in Australia. And I said to her, what has always disturbed me about this particular fashion house is that they display their logo so prominently on every scarf, on every bag, on every piece of merchandise that they, that they produce. And she said to me, look, in doing so, we are predominantly, but not exclusively, catering for the Chinese market. She said Chinese buyers very often want logos on what are seen as luxury brands um, displayed prominently so that the world can see what they can now afford. Absolutely. And then the, I must say, it's not be, only because I'm Chinese, this is not unique. No, indeed. To Chinese. No, indeed it's yes. not. But in but in China, I think this trend is just more excessive. Um, 
Well, then we come to this another the worst the consequence is the the waste. Yes. And absolutely. The fashion industry now has become the second biggest polluter right after the oil industry. Uh, according to a research in 2018, there was uh, uh, an estimate of 70,000 tons of a textile um, waste every day. And 2.5 billion tons of polluted waste water every day. And the number is, uh, is amazing, yes. amazingly high. Yes, it certainly is staggering. Uh, Vivian, what role does China play today in the world of fashion, but specifically in this area of sustainability? Oh, um, unfortunately, the next uh, 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 data shows that China uh, occupied more than 50% of all of this waste. Uh, uh, but I do, I do want to, to defend China a little bit, because we all know today China is a world um, closed factory. So those figures, those more than half of a waste figure, is, um, some of them is on behalf of the international multinational uh, uh, big fashion company. Also, another excuse for Chinese, they are like me. Um, they actually, their obsession with fashion is, can be seen as a reaction to their deprived yes, the yes, past. Yes, I can understand that. Yes. However, the deeply rooted uh, conforming culture and their new um, sense of a superiority and lead them to, this, to, become, to, to the position of a key player in this daily increasing fashion West. But... What I want to say about one thing, perhaps a little bit uh, uh, unknown to many uh, uh, Westerners, is that there is an old belief, an old prejudice against the recycling clothes, as in Chinese society. Anything uh, that has been worn by another person, um, no one wants to touch it. Because if you wear those uh, pre on the clothes, you might be uh, touched, affected by their bad fortune. So this is almost a magical belief that is widely held mm. and very strong until now. Whether it's in China or overseas Chinese, in France, in Australia, they all shun the uh, recycled clothes. Do you have any plans to tackle this issue? And I'm very mindful of the fact that when we started this discussion, Vivian, we both agreed that recycling fashion was about more than just sustainability. In the recycling, reworking, remodeling process, there can and should be a creative element. And then in other words, the creation or recreation of something beautiful, new, something un unique. Because this urge, this very creative, this very human urge to be creative cannot be suppressed, not by any political system, even the most repressive. Would you agree? When I become conscious of clothes, I was living in poverty and also living in a very harsh political environment. Indeed. But I saw how my false grandma, with her ingenious hands and with her unsuppressible desire mm -hmm. for color and the pattern and the turn the, the turn on the you know an old or torn garment into a thing of beauty butterfly applique um, knee patches we we wore or flowers embroidered on the torn elbows and the uh, patchwork quilts tablecloths and when everything becomes too worn out, it still won't be thrown out. Yes. Because it could be used to make shoes. Does your novel focus on this aspect of fashion, Vivian? Well, I, I, I planned a novel to be called Butterfly Applique. You can see the influence of my false grandma mm -hmm. on me. And set in the world of a recycled fashion, it is in part a challenge to the old belief 
to the prejudice against the recycled clothes. And it also sprang out my commitment um, to the uh, sustainable ways of living. And of course, it's also uh, inspired by my interest, my own interest in secondhand clothes. I love shopping in secondhand shop. It's not for saving money only. Um, the very important thing is, I think it is very easy to create my own image. And uh, I'm not bound to whatever it is sold uh, in closed stores at any one time. I can choose. I'm free. Indeed you can. And, and that is a passion that we share, of course, Vivian, and we, we have had a few forays together into secondhand or vintage shops um, and enjoyed the process. And I very much hope it's something we continue to do together. And then we become our, ourselves. We are. And, and by continuing to do that, I, I hope that we just make our very own very small contribution to a slow fashion industry. Absolutely. A fashion industry that supports not only sustainability, but individuality, self-expression and creativity. And I look forward to that with you, Vivian, in the Thank future. You. Thank you for Thank the you. conversation today. I should definitely say something about my mother. After all, it was her last words that drove me for so many years and doubtless will never cease driving me. But she died so early and was so efficient in erasing her past that I cannot be sure how much of her rich and worthy life is all in my imagination. What I remember about her does not support that image. She was often frustrated or depressed. Nothing about her life was enviable. I have tried hard to recall a moment when I saw her happy and can only find one. She's sitting on the veranda playing the arhu for the neighbors. When she finishes, everyone applauds and she laughs out loud. I must have been very young because I don't have any idea when or why that happened. I didn't backtrack and I settled in Australia. I became a teacher and a published writer, mastered English and started to learn French. I have listened to my mother and kept embracing new choices. I share my life with a husband who loves books, a son who is crazy about the birds, a golden retriever and the three domestic short-haired cats whom I worship for their alert, unsentimental and independent approach to life. I'm far away from my childhood home and the village of a guest, but my past is always with me. One day, I hope my mother appears in my dreams again, sitting with me on my sun-drenched veranda, drinking coffee as we watch the goldfish swim in the pots and the ponds of my garden. Both of us relaxed and pleased where my life has brought me so far.